Well, good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. You know, Barbara and Byron and I are delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a blessed Sabbath. Um, we're pleased that you've decided, of course, to join us virtually to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson this week. And what a lesson we have. Barbara, will you pray for God's blessing on this morning's study? Of course. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we're thankful for this study you've given us. This study on crucibles has really given us an opportunity to understand you better. Amen. It's helped us to understand all of the principles that go with struggle and conflict and pain, Lord. Amen. And so we just pray that as we go through this lesson, we learn more about you. We learn more about what your plan is for Amen. our lives and for our salvation, Lord. That we learn how to handle these crucibles victoriously. Amen. And so as you use these uh, principles to guide us, to direct us, that we will understand, that we will accept that with knowing that you are only interested in doing our good. So thank you, Lord for being with us and hearing our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks so much, Bar Barbara. And I'm really delighted that the two of you have joined me for this Sabbath School class. This is an incredible class. The uh, key text or the memory text for this week is found in Romans chapter 5, verses 5. And by the way, this week's Sabbath School lesson is titled Indestructible Hope. And what an incredible title for for this lesson, and you will see it as we unpack it. Romans chapter 5, verse 5 tells us, Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. An incredible statement. And if you had an occasion to really study it, study it a little. Um, in Romans chapter 8, verses 16, Romans 8, 16, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And so what the memory verse is telling us is that it is the Holy Spirit that pours out love in our hearts by testifying of Jesus Christ. And as we behold the glory, the perfection, and the love of Jesus, we are changed into his likeness under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Incredible. And if that isn't enough to give us enough hope already, what is? So here's a brief uh, overview of this, this week's Sabbath School lesson. I like to always provide uh, an overview when, when I am leading so that you know where, where we're about to go. In our previous six uh, lessons, We've studied how God uses crucibles for the holy purpose of refining Christ's character within each one of us. As we've studied, we've seen that such crucibles may come because God sees something special within us that he wishes to attend to. And we're really, really talking about modifying or improving or perfecting. Or crucibles may also emerge as a direct result of your own prayers for spiritual growth. And uh, I have experienced that, and I know that that happens. As we've learned, God does not refine us simply by sending us a special, a, a, a special feeling of the Holy Spirit. Rather, God uses the Holy Spirit in conjunction with specific life situations. And as you and I have experienced, often situations that we may not like or enjoy. In the remaining seven lessons for this quarter, beginning with, with this week's lesson, we will become acquainted with six different graces that God desires to refine us with. Each of these may, may call for a different type of crucible. In this week's lesson, we will begin exploring hope. We will examine what is hope, and what is its source and its foundation. Last week's lesson focused on the importance of truth and understanding, 
This week's lesson looks at hope from the perspective of the biblical truth about God, who is the source of real hope. Often when we find ourselves within the crucible, hope does not always seem so easy. As circumstances press in around us, we begin to actually question everything. And particularly, let's, let's be honest, God's wisdom and God's love for each one of us. We struggle with the idea that for us to have peace, to have confidence, to have hope, God must be understandable and predictable. That He needs to be, in our thinking, safe. Well, that is just unfortunate, because that's never the case. We are opening ourselves up to fail if we really think that that's what needs to take place. We don't always understand God, and at times God seems to do unpredictable things. That, however, that doesn't mean that God is against you or against me. It simply means that we don't have the full picture yet. In times of crisis, the hope we need is not a self-generated desire, but a solid grounded trust in God's promises. So then, how does our understanding of the character of God help us maintain hope in the crucible? In the crucible. Well, this week's study gives us several lessons that, that emerge and will help us answer that very question. First, God widens our horizon so that we may locate ourselves and our experience within the larger framework of the plan of salvation and the prophetic events, the prophetic message. This reality is exemplified in the lives of Daniel, Habakkuk, and Job. Secondly, God presents himself to us as the creator and the redeemer, as the one who loves us and is present with us every day. Third, God reveals to us His plans with us and for us. We are not some expendable elements in a crisis. We are indispensable parts of God's creation, God's life, and God's plans. And I want you to believe that, because that's the truth. Even if we are in crisis, God will never allow us to be lost. You see, in John chapter 10, Jesus tells us with all solemnity that you and I are His sheep, that He is our shepherd, that His plan is to give us eternal life, and that no one will ever snatch us out of His or the Father's hand. Significant. God may allow us to go through various crises, but these crises are designed to help us grow. This week's lesson also highlights two major themes. See, the first of these themes helps us understand the larger framework of the plan of salvation and how prophetic events play a crucial role in helping us cultivate the hope that helps us overcome the crucibles of life. The, the second theme helps us understand how the biblical source of hope lies in understanding who God is that He is with us, and that He has plans for and with us. So I, I really hope that you, you, you will enjoy this lesson. Byron, Sunday's lesson talks about the big picture. Describe it. The big picture. Okay, so you wonder what that means, huh? I know I looked at it. I did. Now the lesson goes into Habakkuk and how... He talks about how basically bad things are, and God tells him it's going to get worse, but it will eventually get better. Mm -hmm. But we're going to take a little different spin on the big picture here. So you're looking at something, right? And you're not close up and personal, but from a distance, a high-level view, somewhat like a general overlooking a battle and not the skirmish in the trenches, right? But I'll tell you that soldier that's in the trenches sees nothing but the fight right in front of him. Right. 
oblivious to the overall goal of the offensive at that time. So Victor, say you have a painful tooth, a painful tooth right? And, oh, my tooth's bothering me. And then you kick the door and stub your toe. You go, oh, I hurt my toe. And then you say, I go, how's your tooth? And you say, what tooth? Because we focus on that moment, right? We focus on the toe. Oh, right, we focus on whatever our crisis is at that moment. Exactly. So I want to actually read Romans 8, 28 and 29. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. That sounds like a big picture goal, right? For all of us. So where does God want us to be? With him, obviously, in this world and especially the next. Think of it. There's 8 billion people in this world, all with the freedom of choice to do as they please. And God, in his infinite wisdom, is able to blend our free will, all 8 billion, with his providence, accomplishing his will in spite of our bad choices. That is something. Just incredible, absolutely. But you might say, well, I had, uh, had so-and-so, and you can fill in the blank for whatever the crisis that happened, happened to me, and it's not fair. And I'm going to throw out that, you know, perhaps we should read John 9, 1 through 3. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, mm -hmm. that he would be born blind? And Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, mm -hmm. but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Mm -hmm. That sounds harsh, doesn't it? <laughs> blind from birth condemned because of that blindness who sinned him or his parents oppressed and looked down upon from the day he entered this world was it fair now if you ask me on the street no if you ask correct. almost anybody correct. no correct but yet what was the outcome we look at the bigger picture here after the pharisees questioned and then kicked the man out of the temple John 9, 35 through 38 says, Jesus heard that they had put him out, and finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? <laughs> he answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking to you. Amen. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Do you think that man was saved? Yep. God's providence yep. was for him to be saved, but he took a hard road to get there, didn't right. he? Right, absolutely. But in the picture of salvation, what are those years of his life compared to the rest of his right. life and eternity after right. that? Mm -hmm. So God does see that true bigger picture, but we don't. And we never will until we get to heaven. And even then, I don't believe completely. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you, who was the first martyr in the New Testament? Mm -hmm. Stephen. Stephen exactly. Three and a half years after mm -hmm. Jesus died and was resurrected. Mm -hmm. It was a dark day in Christianity. There was great fear in the church. And two things happened. The disciples fled Jerusalem and they began to preach the gospel in mm -hmm. other areas mm -hmm. besides Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. First Samaria and then beyond. Hey, didn't Jesus say that? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Jesus, that's what Christ commanded them. And number two, there was a man there named Saul who condemned Stephen as well, but God touched his heart through Stephen on that day. I want to read Ellen White, Acts of the Apostles, page 101.3. The martyrdom of Stephen made a deep impression upon all who witnessed it. The memory of the signet of God upon his face, his words, which touched the very souls of those who heard who th heard them, remained in the minds of the beholders and testified to the truth of that which he had proclaimed. His death was a sore trial to the church, but it resulted in the conviction of Saul, who could not efface from his memory the faith and constancy of the martyr. 
Amen. and the glory that had rested on his countenance. Yep. Amen. So that one death caused the gospel to spread and helped change, was the beginning point for changing Saul, converting him. Right. Now it took Jesus on the road to Damascus, but let me ask you, how many books in the New Testament did Paul write? Yep. Half. Yep, absolutely. Half of them mm -hmm. are because of this man being converted. This is part of God's bigger plan. Exactly. So we see that the man born blind and the death of Stephen may be extreme examples. Things that would never happen to us or have never happened to us. Mm -hmm. But let me ask you, if you represent Christ well during the trials even in your life, mm -hmm. whether it be a bad day at work, sick mm -hmm. loved ones, whatever it may be, aren't you fitting into that big picture? Right. Aren't you becoming an instrument for God yep. in that bigger picture? Mm -hmm. Especially when he leads you into trials. And I want to actually even dwell on this for a moment. In the early church, why did it grow so quickly? Mm -hmm. People saw this faith. They saw the people and even the martyrs. Mm -hmm. And I could bring up several martyrs. Polycarp was one of them. Mm -hmm. Perpetua was mm -hmm. another mm -hmm. one that was popular at the time during Roman times. And I could go into those stories, but people saw that faith and they saw something that they were missing. And it was that, but they, that thing that they were missing that kept them coming literally in droves at times to find out what these people had so they could be a part of it. So whatever trial you may be going through, especially for God, let us show that the character of Christ Jesus to everyone so that others may wonder what you have, what it is that you possess that they are missing so that they can come to seek guidance from you to find out truly the way to salvation. Amen. And, and, and Byron, um, I, I really appreciate the way you, you've developed the theme of the big picture. And let's face it, here's Jesus, our creator and our God. He leaves heaven. He leaves the throne. Right. He comes down to this earth through a crucible of its own, dies on the cross for you and for me for us, so that we could have eternal life. Incredible. Amen. Incredible. Barbara, who is our Father? Who is our Father? We're going to look at who our Father is through the eyes of Job today. And as we know, the, uh, Job, as we start the, the, the book of Job, loses everything except his life and his wife. <laughs> and, and I think there were moments he wasn't sure about that. And um, she suggests what he had left was to curse God and die. So let's, let's read that in Job 2, 9 and 10. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. So basically he's calling her foolish. She shall receive good at the hand of God and shall not receive evil. In all this, did not, Job did not sin with his lips. So Job was serious about not sinning. In Job 1, 2, he, he, he had said, Naked came I into my mother's womb, and naked shall I return with her. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I'm sure many of us in our, our lives have had to quote that. Absolutely. You know, it's up to you, God. You give and you take. And so, blessed is your name, period. So then we go to his friends. And when we look at his friends, they, they, are, they were not helpful at all either. <laughs> but as we see through all of this, this is, I mean, there's 42 books or 40, yeah, 42 books and or chapters, chapters, 42 chapters in Job, and God does not speak until chapter 30. Until the very last one. Yeah, and, until ver the very last one in, 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 in Job 38. So we need to remember when we're going through these crucibles, God may not answer you right away. And I want it now. And I think many of you may have that same 
bit of character in you, I want it now. But <clears throat> we see that when God appears and speaks, he, he, um, he imparts to him a lot of knowledge uh, with this plan. So, and as we look at this too, the other interesting piece about this, when God speaks, is he doesn't really lecture Job, he asks questions. It comes through in the form of numerous questions. So let's jump into Job 38, 1 through 8. Then, said the, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, remember who else, who else was it that God talked to out of a whirlwind? Out of the wind. Wasn't that? Um, yeah, hold on. <laughs> okay, I'll come back to you guys. Just shout Elijah. it out. Elijah. There exactly. we go, Elijah. I could, I could see the wheels, yeah. the wheels. <laughs> the I, wheels I could going. even sing that's, the song, but hard. I couldn't remember the name. <laughs> yep. Shows our age here, guys. Oh, it's terrible. So yeah. who is the darketh, who is it that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up thy loins like a man, mm -hmm. and I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? If thou hast understanding. Can you really, can, were you really around, and do you understand mm -hmm. what it took to lay the foundations of the earth? I tell you. Who hath laid the measure thereof, if thou knowest? <laughs> Who hath stretched the line upon it? Mm. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened and who laid the cornerstone thereof right. when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy or shut up the sea with the doors when it break forth and if it had issued out of the womb so God's saying to, to, to Job I created all of this yeah. I made sure that everything works perfectly don't you think I got it in your life <laughs> Don't you think I can, I can manage your life? In verse 12, he says, As thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused um, the dawn, yeah, day spring, uh, to put the day spring in its place, yeah. that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that's the dawn, that the wicked may be shaken out of it. It turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. Right. And from the wicked... Their light hold us, and from thy right arm shall be broken. Right. And in 17, he says, Have the gates of death been opened unto thee? Hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? So, vic so victory here is the key to what he's talking about. He's, go he's going, you know, I've, I, I'm not going to let the wicked rule forever. Right. This isn't going to go on and on. Mm -hmm. He divides the water course over the streams and lightning and the thunder. In 26, he says it causes rain to come on the earth. So he nourishes and sustains us. And I'm going to move on to um, Job 29, 26 through 29. Doth the hawk fly by the wisdom and stretch her wings toward the south? Doth the eagle mount up at thy command and make us her nest on high? She dwelleth and abideth on the rock in the crags of the rock in the strong place. And thence she seeks prey and her eyes behold afar off. He's telling Job that no matter what happens, yep. I do this for the animals, I do this for the birds. Yep. I, will, I will take care of this for you. So after God, they go through all these series of questions, Job has a reply, and he says, I am worthy, I am unworthy, how can I reply? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. And so we see in Job 40, verse 4, he doesn't, he, doesn't really, um, he doesn't really have a good answer for God. Right. He goes, right. um, but, but God is not finished yet. Yeah. So if we look at uh, Job 42, 1 through 6, Job <clears throat> answered the Lord and said, and I have... Re I have um, Put this, I think, in the... No, that's, that's, that's in another place. I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? 
Therefore I have uttered what I do not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I do not know. Listen, please, let me speak. You said, I, qu I will question you and you will answer me. I have heard you by the hearing of my ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. And so we see <clears throat> through this fascinating story right. that God, even though Job had been through all this, he came to Job. He didn't leave Job alone. Job felt alone at times, right. but God never left Job alone. And I want to end this with um, a quote from Desire of Ages, page 471 by Ellen White. Right. It was generally believed that the Jews, to the Jews that sin is punished in this life. Every affliction was regarded as the penalty of some wrongdoing, either of the sufferer himself or of his parents. So, and we, we've seen that with right. the, the Pharisees and Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I, we, we won't go into that, but, um, but they, this is what they believed, that this, the, whatever happened to us on earth was because of our sin here or because of our parents' sin. It is true that all suffering results from the transgression of God's law, but this truth had become perverted. Right. Satan, the author of sin and all its results, had led men to look upon disease and death as proceeding from God as punishment arbitrarily inflicted on account of sin. Hence, one upon whom some great affliction or calamity had fallen had the additional burden of being regarded as a great sinner. The blind man. Right. Yeah. yeah. God had given a lesson designed to prevent this. The history of Job had shown that suffering is inflicted by Satan and is overruled by God for purposes of mercy. But Israel did not understand the lesson. The same error of which God had reproved the friends of Job was repeated by the Jews in their rejection of Christ. The belief of the Jews in regard to the relation of sin and suffering was held by Christ's disciples. So God had a big work to do with them as well. Absolutely. And, and Barbara and Byron... For me, this particular lesson was so meaningful because remember, God does not answer the questions of Job's friends. Job's <laughs> friends ask questions and God doesn't address that at all. Mm -hmm. in, in, in reality, he turns around and say, look around. Who made this? Who do you think you are? And where do you come, come by? Right. And, and sometimes we need, we need to understand that God makes himself so, so big so, so much um, present in our lives, and we fail to feel, and we fail to see, and we fail to touch. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thanks, thanks so much. That's wonderful. Tuesday's lesson talks about our Father's presence, and, and uh, I, I, want you to, 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 I want you to know that from my perspective, it is not only about God's presence in your life every day, but it's God's presence in the most holy place, on your behalf in the presence of God. And I think it is important. Someone when, once asked, when God seems far away, who's the one that has moved away? Who's the one that has moved? You see, when problems strike, we often presume that God has deserted us. The truth, however, is that God has not gone anywhere. He is omnipresent is everywhere all the time. Omnipresent. That's what it means. God, God's presence seemed very far away to the Jews living in exile during the Isaiah's time. And we are going to visit that for this particular portion of the lesson and really um, align uh, the principles and the promises to you and to me. So here you see that... Uh, um, um, so through Isaiah, God assures them, Israel, of future deliverance. Isaiah 41.13, Isaiah chapter 41.13, provides an incredible promise made by God to Israel and to you and me today. And here's what it says. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. This is an incredible promise. I'm not going to unpack it now. We will do it in a little bit. 
while the actual return to Jerusalem was still many years in the future, God wanted His people Israel to know that He had not moved away from them and that there was every reason for hope. There was every reason to be hopeful. So, I'm going to, we, we're going to read uh, verses 8 to 14 of Isaiah 40, 41 in a little bit. But Isaiah 41, 8, 14, uh, let's, uh, let us see, um, let us really understand hope in God, and let's see that hope in our daily journey with God is real, and our hope in the future deliverance is very possible and real. God's promises made to the Jews living in exile during Isaiah's time apply to you and to me today, apply to us today. These are promises made by our God to each one of us today to help us, to give us hope and, and courage as we wait for our exile on this earth to end. And I'm hoping that's really how you feel, that we're in a journey, we're pilgrims, we are journeying towards the new Jerusalem, and we are waiting for God to bring us all home. Isaiah 41, chapter 8. Let's read verse, verse 8. Uh, Isaiah chapter 41, verses 8. Let's read verses 8 of Isaiah 41. And uh, this is how the Lord through Isaiah writes or, or speaks. But you, Israel, are my servant. Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. So in this verse, God tells Israel that he has not rejected them. In fact, he reaffirms the call made to Abraham and to Jacob. He tells them that they are his chosen people, a people with whom he established a covenant relationship by virtue of which Israel had become a servant nation, the representative of Jehovah here on earth. When we read verses 9 and 10, and I invite you to read verses 9 and 10 of Isaiah 41, Here's what we, we are told. It says, You, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from the furthest regions and said to you, You are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. It says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. This is verse 10. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my rights, a righteous right hand. What an incredible promise. See, in verses 9, God reminds Israel that he called Abraham out of Ur to be his representative and to be the founder of a national Israel. He reminds them that he brought them out of Egypt to enter the promised land as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Then he tells them that he chose them. Israel was chosen, just like you and I have been chosen by God. Israel belongs to God by right of divine election to be God's chosen representatives. What an incredible, what an incredible picture. In verses 10, we see that God knows that Israel is in great need of a message of comfort and hope. And you and I are often in a great need of a message of comfort and hope. See, the northern king kingdom, the, the kingdom of Israel, had been wiped out uh, uh, by the Assyrian military might. And it appeared that Judah, the kingdom of Judah in the south, could not longer endure the enemy. So God reminds them that he is with them. He is Emmanuel. He promised to strengthen them and help them and to uphold them with his righteous right hand. What an incredible promise, verse 10 is. Well, let's read verses 11 to 13 of Isaiah 41. More promises to come. Verses 11 and 12 and 13 read as follows. Behold, all those who were incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing. And, as, and those who strife uh, with you shall perish. And then verse 12 says, You shall seek them and not find them. Those who contend with you, 
Those who war against you shall be as nothing, as a non-existent thing. And then verse 13, For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. So verses 11 and 12 is a promise. A promise that was fulfilled in the destruction of Sennacherib's army, if you remember that. And it says that God is reminding Israel that he who, who fights against the people of God fights against him himself. With the help of the Lord, his weakest child is more than a match for all the powers of darkness. That's exactly what he's saying. Everyone who strives against God or against his people will ultimately perish. Whereas the meek and faithful will inherit the earth. In verse 13, the Lord, our, our God, promises to hold our right hand. This is a token of agreement and friendship. This is a sign, a fulfillment of the covenant relationship established with Israel. Israel belongs to God and has total access to His guidance, His strength, and His protection. That's really what it's saying. In that very verse, verse 13, God is tell telling you and I that we don't, do not need to fear because God is the one who takes, holds your right hand. You see, we often imagine God guiding events on earth from a big throne, light ears away from the earth. I hope, however, that you and I realize that God is present in our lives and close enough to hold your hand and my hand, he, the hands of His dearly beloved people. You see, when we are busy, we can be, it can be hard to remember that God is very close to us. But when we, we do remember that He is Emmanuel, that He is God with us. It makes such a difference when God's presence is with us. So we are His purposes, His promises, and His transforming power. Byron, talk about our Father's plans for us. Father's plans for us, Wednesday's lesson. I'd like to start off by reading Psalm 137, verses 1 through 4 an experience of the captivity. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept. When we remembered Zion, upon the willows in the midst of it, we hung our harps. And there our captors demanded of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Right. It's amazing that they actually remember the Lord now. <laughs> because why did they actually get exiled in the first place? How long had God been warning Judah about the consequences if they did not return to him? Read Jer if you read Jeremiah, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. Even during the days of Isaiah, they were warned. Mm -hmm. When Hezekiah showed off all of his stuff mm -hmm. to the Babylonians, Isaiah 39, 5 through 7. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your sons will, who will issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away and they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. So let me ask you, it looks pretty dismal, right? Did God have a plan for Israel, or really for Judah? Yep. I bet he did. Oh, yeah. They were supposed to show the light of God to the world. Even Hezekiah could have told the Babylonians about the God who moved the sundial backwards 10 steps, and that's from Isaiah 38, 8 and glorified him. Instead, he showed him all the treasures and glorified himself. Which at the time of Psalms 137, when it talks about them at the river, 
had already been taken place. So when it talks about the prophecy that Hezekiah received, this has already happened by now. Right. So let me ask you something. Do you think our Father in Heaven has a plan for us, for you, for me, for Victor or Barbara yep. and everyone watching? Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Not only does the Lord want to take us and transform us, he wants to put us to work for him. Correct. That's correct. Today's lesson, if you read the actual, um, the lesson for today, it points out three major points. The first is that God doesn't want Judah to give up hope. Right. And the situation they're in is, God, is by God's design because of their actions. Number two is that he tells them to pray for prosperity and that the city that they're in will prosper too. God wants the best for them in this current situation, at least as good as it can get. Mm -hmm. And number three, God gives them hope for the future. Let's read Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 14. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you and bring you back to this place. And I love that. I want to pause for a moment. You see how God uses prophecy over and over again mm -hmm. to prove the surety of his word, to show that no matter what happens, his will will be done. And we see this here, that promise that they will come back after 70 years. For I know the plans that I, ha I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me, and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. Amen. Now, God will not only bring back Judah in 70 years, and you touched upon it earlier, who does he punish at that time? Yeah. Babylon. Babylon, exactly. Which he prophesies as well. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, Nebuchadnezzar did become a believer, sure. but his descendants, no. Right. So just like the Israel of old, and actually Judah at this time, God has predestined us to do his good pleasure in the world. He wants you and me to be a part of that plan of salvation. Right. No other being gets a choice in this, really, mm -hmm. in the universe, and yet God calls us to do this. So what do we do? Well, first of all, it says in Jeremiah, we read it previously, 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Right. Not part of my heart, not in my spare time or when it's convenient, but will all of my heart be in, it'll be in all of my actions. It doesn't mean that you don't go to work, socialize with people or things like that, but you keep the thoughts of God in your heart and in your mind mm -hmm. that, that people might see that you actually have God exactly. and you act like it. Exactly. In every occasion, Ephesians 1.5 says that he predestined, predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, that is the Father, according to the kind intention of his will. So the Father actually wants us to be co-heirs with Jesus, Amen. adopted heirs, but still heirs. I think I'll take that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he does, that doesn't mean that it's set in stone. But what, God's word set in stone, let me phrase that properly. But 
do we still have to choose it? We can choose to be not predestined. Right. We have that choice. We can refuse. Yep. We can choose our own way or we can do our own will and we have that freedom of choice. But in the end, we do have two choices. The first one is 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a right. holy nation, a right. people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's choice number one. Or we can choose Ephesians 2, 2 in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and that's Satan if you have any questions, right. of the spirit that is now working and the sons of disobedience. If you're not taking choice number one, you automatically fall into the working of the sons of disobedience. Yep. So we have a choice. We all have struggles. I have struggles daily. I have still a, some secret sins that I cherish. I can't lie. Even pride at times. And I'm sure you have your struggles too, whatever they may be. I have mine. We all have ours. But each day, I would urge you each day to come to the cross and to lay down yourself so that Christ may reign supreme in each one of us. Because if we don't, God helps us by disciplining us. And that's going to come into Thursday's lesson, Barbara. Yep. We're going to get into discipline. Yep. Go ahead. Our Father's right. discipline. Yep. And most of, our, most of our, our, actually all of our scripture today is in Hebrews. So Hebrews 12, 1 through 4 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses, let us lie aside every weight and run the sin that so easily doth beset us. Mm -hmm. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Mm -hmm. Look to Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. <clears throat> For who the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. For consider him that endureth the, with such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto the blood, striving against sin. So we see, <clears throat> again, that this whole life is a race. Absolutely. Remember we talked about this mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago. Yep. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Yep. And we see, too, in this life that there were others who came before us who have had struggles, mm -hmm. and there will those be <clears throat> every day who have struggles. Right. But one of the, what we need to remember is Jesus' life was not easy. Right. Now our lives yeah. are full of sin, but he had no sin, but yet he was still, um, he still struggled because of sin. Right. And so we need to <clears throat> make sure we're clear on that. <clears throat> So right. in Hebrews 12, 5 through 13, which we're going to get to in just a couple minutes, um, Paul describes the trials in context of discipline. In fact, um, we see in the NIV version various forms of the word discipline, but the Greek word for discipline is also education. Mm -hmm. So when we look at some of this as education and not <clears throat> merely uh, what we think of discipline as being punished. But so God educates us in the school of faith. Right. And Paul understood this. So he starts with Hebrews 11, and we see all of these heroes of faith. Mm -hmm. Abel, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who, who did a better sacrifice than mm -hmm. Cain. Enoch, mm -hmm. walked with God, didn't see death. Noah, the ark, Abraham. Mm -hmm. God said, go, he went. Sarah mm -hmm. <clears throat> had a baby. And we see with all of these, these greats, they had struggles. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, Isaac, Jacob, Esau, Joseph, Moses. Think about Moses. He, <clears throat> he, was, um, he, wouldn't, uh, he was born hidden, 
grew up in paganism, but mm-hmm. yet he chose God and he chose God's people, and so he walked away from that. Right. Well, actually, he ran away from that. And then he also led the children of Israel through the Red Sea to the edge of the Promised Land. And the, and the book also, um, here in Hebrews, talks about Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Sa- Samson, Japheth, David, Samuel, and the prophets. And I'm, I, I hope he's including Daniel and the prophets because sure. I think Daniel's one of the greater greats of faith. So their faith kept them going, even though they faced very, very difficult situations. So then as we go farther into chapter 12, so many people have preserved against incredible odds. We also right. run to finish the, fa- the life of faith. Right. And they did this by keeping their eyes fixed on Jesus. Even Amen. then, they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus. Amen. And so <clears throat> if we, we keep reading now in 12, we're going to concentrate on discipline. But before we jump into those scriptures, I want to read to you a quote here from uh, Ellen White, Acts of the Apostles. Mm-hmm. There is a lesson for us in the experience of Paul, for it reveals God's way of working. The Lord can bring victory out of that which may seem to us discomfiture and defeat. Right. Even when we're defeated, God has a place for victory. Yep. Amen. We are in danger of forgetting of forgetting God, Amen. of looking at things that are seen instead of beholding the eye of faith of things which are unseen. When misfortune or calamity comes, you are ready to change and charge God with neglect and cruelty. Mm-hmm. How many times when we go, why me, God? Why are you so cruel? Why are you letting this happen? Mm-hmm. It's not God at all. If he sees fit, to cut off our usefulness in some line, we mourn, not stopping to think that thus God may be working for our good. Right. We need to learn that chastisement is part of the great plan and that under the rod of affliction, the Christian may sometimes do more for the master than when engaged in service. So wherever God puts us, he has a plan for us. Amen. Um, Amen. If we lose our Amen. job, Amen. he may have a better plan for us. Mm-hmm. If, if we lose a position that we think is important, he may have a, a, a better plan for us. Right. And so we're going to talk, look now at Hebrews 12, 5 through 13. And where, and this is in the, what I'm going to be reading to you is from the Amplified Version. Sometimes to me, Paul gets a little confusing. So I have, to, I have to go to the Amplified Version to get it all. But I, I really like the way it was written, so I'm going to, to use that. And you, Hebrews uh, 5. And you have forgotten the divine word of encouragement, which is addressed to you as sons. And do not lose heart and give up when you are corrected by him. Mm-hmm. So we can't get discouraged. We can't, um, we shouldn't. Um, become rebellious and run from God. And sometimes that's hard to do because I've, I've done all of those things. Right. And I think, I think some of us do. Absolutely. For the Lord disciplines and corrects those he loves. Mm-hmm. So when we're, when we're being corrected, when we're being disciplined, we have to understand it's because God loves us. Amen. And he punishes every son who receives and welcomes him to his heart. You must submit to correction for the purpose of discipline. God is dealing with you as with sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? Now, if you are exempt from correction and without discipline, in which all God's children share, then you are illegitimate children and not sons at all. Right. So we need, to be, we need to be thanking God when we're going through Amen. these crucibles. Moreover, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we submitted and respected them, training for us all. Shall we not so much more willingly submit to the Father of spirits and live by learning from his discipline? 
For our earthly fathers disciplined us for only a short time, as seemed best to them. But he, God, disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. For the time being, no discipline brings joy, but seems to be sad and painful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness, Amen. right standing with God, and a lifestyle and attitude that seeks conformity to God's will and purpose. Mm -hmm. So then strengthen hands that are weak and knees that tremble. Cut through and make smooth, straight paths for your feet that are safe and go in the right direction so that the leg which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather may be healed. Amen. And so we see that <coughs> sometimes we look at this as discipline, but there are actually lessons through life. So to, to add my final thoughts, um, I would like to share with you from our higher calling um, from Ellen White. If we hope to wear the crown, this is important, if we hope to wear the crown, we, may, we must expect to bear the cross. Our greatest trials will come from those who profess godliness. Right. I had to read that one a couple of times because we see that... Um, that our biggest trials come from those who profess the godliness. Tares among the wheat. Yep. Mm -hmm. Or even sometimes wheat among the wheat. Right. Mm. It also, it, it was so with the, with the world's redeemer, and it will be so with his followers. Mm -hmm. Those who are in earnest to win the crown of eternal life need not be surprised or disheartened because every step toward heavenly Canaan, they meet with obstacles, encounters, and trials. The Savior knows this best. Amen. Thanks so much, uh, Barbara. Thank you, Byron. I really appreciate uh, your contribution this morning. You know, um, as, as, I, as, as I think in terms of this particular lesson, um, I prepared the, f the following final thoughts and appeal, an appeal for you and appeal for me. You see, from the very first moment of the crisis of sin on our planet. God wove hope into the very fabric of our history from that very moment by promising us that he would save us and restore us to his kingdom. That is hope in itself. You see, the Bible is full of promises of hope of historical factors that gives us the ability to encourage ourselves and, and hope. But I'm going to just spend a little time in the New Testament. A brief study of hope in the New Testament reveals several important aspects that in, to encourage you and to encourage me in our journey. You see, the Apostle Paul in his letter to, to the Corinthians enumerates three major Christian virtues. And I'm talking about 1 Corinthians 13:13. 13, 13. You probably know the verse by heart where it says, faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love are the Christian virtues. It is true that Paul picks love as the greatest of the three. But in Colossians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, Paul explains that both faith and love spring from hope. You see, hope is the foundation for faith and for love. And that's so important. Amen. In the definition of hope, Paul says that hope is an anchor of the soul. It is both sure and steadfast. But such hope is anchored in Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Let's read that together. Hebrews chapter 6, <clears throat> verses 19 and 20, where Paul says, This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. Can you see the connection between God, the throne of God, the most holy place, mm. Christ our high priest moving into the presence on our behalf? Then verse 20 says, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus. Who is the forerunner? Jesus. Having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. What a promise to know 
that your, your Savior, your Creator, our High Priest, Jesus, who died for me and for you at the cross, He's mediating for you and for me. A source of hope that is absolutely significant. Paul explains and discusses hope in the context of suffering. And you've heard from Barbara, and I'm not going to repeat that. In Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 27, Paul takes time to discuss hope extensively. And I urge you to read this passage of Scripture. I just do not have time to do so here. Romans truly is, in chapter 8, truly is a chapter of hope. But in verse 18, and I want to read verse 18, Romans 8, 18 says, I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. If you know Paul's story, if you know what he went through, and he has the courage to say, <clears throat> I consider that the sufferings of this present time, whatever happened to me through this journey, is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us. That's what you and I need to look at. We need to, like, uh, to, to look at not what is, but what will be. As Amen. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians. You see, in this passage of Scripture, Paul also highlights the fact that all nature suffers. It's not only us individually, but nature Nothing in the natural world is exempt of suffering. Suffering is a complex package. Suffering encompasses the totality of what makes us human. Our physical, our moral, emotional, and spirit, spiritual dimensions of being. So yes. Yes, my friend, and my brother and my sister. We do experience suffering. We do experience disappointment. Lack of understanding, lack of an ability to properly express ourselves and even pray in agony. But as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, the Holy Spirit helps us with his mediation before God. Let's read it. It says in verse 26, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought to. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groaning which cannot be uttered. Verse 27, pay attention. Now He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Who's searching the heart? God is. Because He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Ultimately, the essential aspect of this entire situation is to trust God and believe, as Scripture states in Romans chapter 8, verses 28, that all things work together for good to those who love God. I hope you believe that in the midst of pain and in the midst of all kinds of difficulties. I hope that you believe that. It is for this reason that we Christians exercise the patience of hope, as mentioned by Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3. The patience of hope. My friend and my brother and my sister, have courage. <clears throat> by faith in Jesus Christ, go the Go the mile. Be there all the time. And have that hope. That hope that God's, God is with you. He is for you. He is by you. And He will hold your right hand into the very eternity with Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, open my eyes so I may see your love at all times. Lord, strengthen our faith that we may trust you even when it seems impossible. Oh Lord, we seek to be more like you. Father, purify our hearts 
so you may dwell in us. That the life of Jesus may be manifest in our mortal flesh. Oh Lord, thank you for the promises that you have provided. And to the, this week's lesson was a lesson full of promises. Where you told us you would be with us. You told us that you would, you would hold our hand. You told us that you would fulfill you would fulfill all the promises that you made for us. You told us that you chose us. You told us that you get it together as, as a hand brings the chicks together. Father, anoint us with your Holy Spirit and prepare us for your soon coming. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Have a wonderful ha Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Have Sabbath. Have a blessed day.